do have a fair bit of uh, work to do today. And with your help and support, there's uh, two exercises that we'll um, use to demonstrate some of the techniques we used in, in our cross-cultural engagement work. Um, we're meeting on the lands of the Bidigal community uh, people, and I acknowledge the uh, leaders uh, from the Aurora Nation, sorry, and I acknowledge their leaders, their inalienable connection with their country, and pass on respect to uh, leaders current and emerging and past. I've had the privilege, as Ellie mentioned, of working in, uh, in Bulgaria, in East Kimberley, but also widely across North Australia, including Central Australia, um, and North Queensland, as well as WA. I am from Western Australia. Um, similar to Julia, I am an architect by original qualification, uh, which even though it's still in, in the name of our business, uh, I work on the people side of architecture. That's how I explain the fact that we do community engagement, a lot of community engagement work at the front end of projects, hopefully before decisions are made about what's actually going to be done. And so I like getting in right as early as possible so, so that the community can actually participate. Um, in that time, the last 30 years, I've met some amazing people and worked on some amazing projects. And those people who have stuck in my memory, um, not many of them unfortunately no longer with us, but have made a lasting impression on my work and my relationships with others and with family. I have four children, a lovely life partner who uh, I've shared my life with for 47 years. Um, she is from a health background and as we, in our business, we've always um, said that we would have half men and half women, so to ensure that when we do work on projects, we're seen as a team, not as individuals. Um, three of our children have also uh, been working on the site. So, it's a privilege to be here and share this story, unfortunately, Devon can't be here. He does provide a pretty amazing uh, story, his life story, his own personal story of healing, uh, which you will see in the film that we'll show um, very soon. But firstly, perhaps we could all stand up, please. And very simple exercise. And breathe deep, briefly, in and out. And do that five times. One more for luck. Breathing is at the centre of a lot of what we do. Please stand, okay, keep standing. Now, who has worked with Indigenous people, First Nations people in a urban or suburban situation? If you have, please sit down. If you are of Aboriginal descent, you can also sit down. Anybody who's worked in regional and remote areas, and with Indigenous people. Those who never worked in Aboriginal communities, put up your head. Right, okay, well that, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. In our work, we start with seven practices. This underlines all of our work, and I won't dwell on these too long, but just to pictures will be just uh, shared in the film as well, and we'll touch on it later. But firstly, to engage the community as partners in development, not merely as recipients of development or as informants. And it's very much in line with the empowerment at, right at the top end, that is certainly where we work towards in terms of the IAP2 spectrum. Building strong relationships is an essential part of that, and that's been mentioned a lot in these last few days as being central uh, to that. It's interesting when you talk about people going to meetings and how do you engage with as many people as possible. And we found that instead of arranging time frames and agendas and itineraries around our needs, if we say, look, we want to 
pursue this project and engage with people and develop a strong working relationship, we're going to come to your community and we're going to stay there a few days so that we can actually, we might set up a table outside the store, um, one of the stores or a shop um, at the local government, local council office, uh, at the health centre, sporting ground, and different times of the day at the school. And we found that's one way you really get to meet most of the people that you uh, are looking to try and connect with. And let people know what you're doing. So you have a handout, you not necessarily have any questions to ask, just say who you are and that you've got family and so on. Um, so we always start our projects with an interview. We can advise it to be on projects and say, well, no, let's, let's hold back. Um, how about we come for an interview just to make sure there's a good fit between what you're trying to achieve out of a project and what we might be able to offer. And that's the beginning of our cultural learning, because we say, well, we never worked with you before. Um, we need to learn, we try and learn some language, and certainly we start to understand the protocols, start asking about the protocols. And, oops, and we always start doing some research, even before the interview, there's nothing worse than going to a, a, a meeting or an interview where you ask silly questions, questions you really should at least have some background information about, because that doesn't build respect. People do expect you to arrive with at least being prepared. And good planning, preparation does lead to good outcomes later. Of course, listening, reviewing, reflecting, it's a very much an interactive process, it's not a one-off. Um, we use diverse methods and aids, which we'll show you in a minute. And collaboration is really at the heart of all of our working relationships. It's not a matter of um, saying, well, we want you as a consultant or we want to, you to be, an, uh, be part of the team. No, we want to collaborate. This is a co-design or co-working relationship. So in this session, I look forward to sharing a bit of an introduction to the project the framework that we use to put all this together. Um, just let you know that all of this has been done pro bono so far, and it's three years uh, so far. The film talks about 18 months, but it's actually three years. And with your help, we'll work through two examples of the community engagement uh, work that we did. Enough is enough. Some background information. So the local community, senior elders, men and women, decided that family violence was starting to destroy their community, not just the indigenous community, but the broader community as well. And they wanted to set up a new way of thinking about this. So reducing the incidence of family violence and keeping women and children safe. I won't dwell on these statistics. Um, but needless to say, they're pretty damning and the responses that uh, the system currently provides essentially centre around women's refuges or extracting the families out of that uh, violent situation and therefore removing them from potentially supportive environments and Devon have talked about that, <coughs> excuse me, or sending the men to jail where over time there have been, over the last few years, there have been many programs to anger management and so on, but they're very short term. So, there's a need for an alternative. Healing, not incarceration. The group are looking for long term change, not just short term. Healing begins on country. So instead of sending the, people, the men to either Perth or Roeburn, so that's a map of Western Australia for those not familiar, um, with Roeburn Newman, where the Madhu people and the Nublu people are, and Roeburn, which is where the regional prison is, and Perth, where the, there's the civil prisons. <coughs> Recidivism is chronic, so an alternative was needed. 
And because healing was seen as a very important part of the project, it needed to be on country. And preferably a site that had cultural connections. Apologies for the quality of this. But the yellow dots identify some cultural, registered cultural sites in the Newman area that the elders said, look, if possible, can we get somewhere close to that? Uh, some, either one of those, a site or close to one of those. So the Shire, very thankfully, said, look, we'll give you a site, which is actually this bit down here, um, where the owners and managers of this reserve, government reserve, crown land, but we're happy to excise this little bit at the bottom because it's probably not going to be used and um, it's away from the major leasable, lettable sites. I said to Devon when we, uh, after we engaged, look, don't accept that yet. Let's have a re do some research on what the site's like. What, what does it offer? And it's below the 100-year flood level. That's the Fortescue River there, which is a major uh, flooded, flooding river in the wet season. And has major drains from the Great Northern Highway, which is the major thoroughfare between Perth and the northwest and into the Territory. <coughs> um, plus it was de very degraded. And obviously that's why the Shire said, well, you can have it, just like, just like in the past. Oh, you can have that land next to the rubbish tip outside town. You know, that's, well, and it seemed to be the case here. Anyway, so we said to the elders, look, what, this little bit up here is a lot closer to some land that's above the one in one year flood level and is much closer to the proposed access road here. How about you ask them for that piece? And Devon said, no, no, let's ask them for the whole lot. And I said, no, 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 don't, don't be greedy. Just ask for this bit here. And as you can see, there used to be a road coming down here. I said, I think they might come back to you and say, why don't you have the whole lot? Anyway, yes, they did. They said, the Shire passed the motion granting that piece there, um, and this piece was added to it. Of significance of, for this is that this site includes several um, sites of significance, cultural significance, whereas that site didn't. And that's one of the reasons why this area here was preferred. And there's sites actually on here, in this corner here, um, which are not actually on any register, but were identified to us once we built the relationships. We were able to um, identify that that was an area that should be on the site and protected and, and conserved. Anyway, um, so it's culturally connected. As it happens, there's a, um, a dreaming track that goes through the site down, and you'll see re that reference in the film in a minute, um, and then changes direction in the middle of the site here and goes right up to Newman. So it's culturally connected, and importantly, it's 10 kilometres out of town. So if people do decide to walk out, they can, but it's still 10k to get to the town. Some background about our work. Um, so every project starts with common complexity and that's not every that's not at all and one of our tasks uh, when we take on a project is to say well okay um, how are we going to sort some of that stuff out so trying to build relationships and understanding um, and broadening the engagement to the second layer of stakeholders and the third layer the, the ones who actually do the approvals and need to sign off on stuff some people might say they're in the second layer, I don't know. It's going to put them in the third layer. And then there's a fourth layer, the unintended stakeholders that you, you realise are going to be there, who can penetrate right through and, make, and be a, an absolute pain in the neck. So they've got the daggers out. Um, but anyway, building relationships and being prepared, risk management and all that, is really important.
enhance the understanding. A lot of this stuff you can find if you do the research before you start doing consult detail uh, engagement work. And the importance of a multi-skilled collaborative team, especially including local people who have knowledge, <coughs> skills, understandings, everything that you need is often right there and then. It's a matter of people understanding that their contribution can actually make, uh, sorry, their knowledge can make a contribution to the project. We had a case recently where, no, a few years ago, that is, um, relates to this recently, where we were doing a, a major housing upgrading program and had employed a lot of local people to work on that. And we're short of a plumber. <coughs> and I said to the team, surely there's somebody here in the community who's done plumbing work. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Jimmy, he is in his 60s now, but he used to be the head man on the housing team. He, I'm sure he was a plumber. So I said, oh, well, how come he's not here? He said, oh, no, well, why don't you go and ask him? And so we organised, he and I went and spoke to him and eventually got round to, would you like to be part of the team? And, and, and I said, but how come you didn't say that you would be involved? He said, well, you didn't ask me. <laughs> so finding out what skills are in the community or in your town or wherever your locality is so important. You do get surprises. And so collecting, analysing and ordering all of this stuff is really important. So the development framework is very much centred around people. People are well and truly in the middle of it. And it sorts itself into eight and probably nine, like the political sphere is not there. It is in my last, uh, my latest iteration of this. Um, and the political sphere can either make or break a project sometimes, especially when they've got time frames and constraints on what you're doing. <coughs> um, the economic side, one of the uh, important parts of the MHC, the Actual Mail Ceiling Centre, is that the organisation want to be economically independent in time. So part of the land transfer from the Shire to the MHC, one of the uh, requirements for the land transfer was that the land could actually be subdivided or sublet, not subdivided to sale, but subdivided to sublet. So that the organisation can then uh, joint venture with other organisations or set up an organisation themselves to generate income plus potential training and employment. So economic development is very much part of what a lot of um, our clients get onto. So all of those issues that I've passed, um, identified on the previous page start getting sorted and within each of those you could put, I call that a bubble diagram, and so you take one of those eight or nine, including the political, and you put that in the middle, and then you get the clients or the group to start saying, well, how, in terms of, you know, let's say, economic development activities, what are you thinking needs to be part of that? And this whole process is discussed at the beginning of the project. Say, so, look, we don't have a set path of what is going to come out of this. It's very free form. But, it's structured in terms of there's a background framework. Does that make sense? So getting started, the community had already done a vision uh, document and a very basic one and also had done a business case or a business plan that was funded. They got funding through Lottery West in Western Australia, which is still a government-owned instrumentality and they provide grants to community organisations physical infrastructure and all sorts of other things. So they got some money for a business plan to be done and that was a huge uh, benefit to us when we were, before we went up for the interview <coughs> excuse me, um, to actually read that and get much, much more detail about what they're thinking, what they've already been thinking. But we actually revisited a lot of that um, through the, the work we were doing. So in short, uh, the, plan, the film will show a lot more detail about uh, and fill in perhaps some of the uh, issues that you might have put in your head already. 
uh, or questions. So we will show the film now. <coughs> Simply the problem, they're the one that uses violence, and uh, the women and the children are uh, the victims are caught up in it. Um, so it, it doesn't seem right, it doesn't seem appropriate that it should be the women and the children that have to leave the home and flee. Um, it's, the, it's they're not the problem. The male, the man who's using violence is the problem. So therefore, it should be he that is removed. Um, and, and if need be, then you know, frontline services. So the culture is very important in bringing back, or in this case too as well, where, where it is and where it is, does exist, preserving it and, and then moving from there forward with, with our culture because culture and, and, and law for men has been, has been um, our way of life. And, and we need to, we need to recognise that as men and, 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 and bring that in and, and find that balance in, in the healing pathways um, uh, because we live in two worlds and um, that's the balance we have to find that exists in two worlds. It should be that the men are forced to leave the home and confront and be made accountable and responsible for their actions of the use of violence. And of course that would be through a mandatory centre that specifically deals with the, um, uh, the nature of the individual's actions. I've been very pleased to be involved with this project because it provides a wonderful opportunity to break a cycle of despair that we've been seeing for far too long. It astounds me that we haven't thought of this solution a long time ago because it provides an opportunity to leave the victims of domestic violence in their homes, while at the same time removing perpetrators for periods of up to 12 months and placing them in an environment where there is an opportunity for meaningful behavioural change, thereby protecting the victims of domestic violence and the community, and all this in a culturally appropriate way. The vision was inspired five years ago with the objective to successfully and effectively deliver a unique place of healing that is designed, built, operated and managed by local people. Through the supportive energy of the AMHC board and reference group, a business plan was produced as the first step for advancing the vision towards reality. The positive reception of the business plan then prompted the AMHC board to advance other areas of development, including the engagement of a clinical director to develop a clinical program and the sourcing of other specialist professionals. With the assistance of CoLab, Margot Matthews, and the Indigenous Community Volunteers Organisation, Doyle Radcliffe, a large number of people, specialists, consultants, private enterprise, government and community agencies have been engaged and have contributed in a unique collaborative project development process, the majority of whom have generously donated their time pro bono. This includes Jeff Barker and Paul McDonald, who 18 months ago were invited for an interview with the reference group in Newman to lead the technical specialist team. That interview very quickly turned into a welcome and the first technical workshop from which the needs and ideas map was produced. In the time since the first workshop, a well-skilled and experienced technical team has been assembled, led by Jeff and Paul, including Harrop, providing the engineering input, who together have facilitated the sourcing of a parcel of land and made initial recommendations for the delivery of a residential healing centre close to Newman. The process has involved site visits, cultural learnings, research, workshops and interactive design sessions that have delivered concept design plans for the buildings, the landscaping, road access, site development and infrastructure all of which will be presented to the Shire Planner, the WA Planning Commission and the Lands Department for consideration and approval. 
The site that was ultimately recommended and approved has been provided by the Shire of East Pilbara and is now in the process of being transferred to the AMHC for the development of their centre. It's located opposite the Newman Airport between the Great Northern Highway and the Fortescue River and includes a number of sites of cultural significance which will be protected and conserved as part of the site development. Is the cap in the wrong road? You go. That's what I can go. You. He'll go, is it? He'll go. Come through there, through the gap there, through the gap there, through long here. Like that. Down past Round Hill. Yeah, past Round Hill. Long, it's a river there. Late in 40s. In 40s. Yeah. Right. And um, a lot of people, on we were the boys. Up, you know. But the old people, but the only people, been busted. From the beginning of the architect's involvement, the project has been implemented as a people-centred development process, wherein the MHC board and reference group work in partnership with the specialists who themselves are working collaboratively. The project has reached a critical stage in that the value of the concept in terms of making change in the community through justice reinvestment can now only be achieved in full with the collaborative funding model. The reinvestment being sought here amounts to a capital budget of $40 million, plus funding for ongoing operations and management. Raising this amount of resources is not seen as a barrier, but as an invitation to all to be part of the movement for change and contribute to this unique vision. should clarify that the site, the 40 million that's talked about, half of that is actually for infrastructure. The site is, uh, even though it's very brown, is a greenfield site. So it has no water, no power, no sewage, no road access. Those roads are now the responsibility for the Aboriginal Mountains Healing Centre to put in off the Great Northern Highway. And because it's a major intersection with a, this massive road where road trains 50 metres long do 110 kilometres an hour, that intersection is likely to cost around five million dollars, that's what I'd say. And then the connector road in is another three million, it's got to be um, built to cater for major uh, transport trucks. So anyway, so a big thank you to everybody there. We are back, thank you. <laughs> So I just quickly wanted to just show some of the um, activities and sessions that we did run and many of them involved the Shire, the Main Roads Department, Town Planners um, and other stakeholders, uh, BHP who um, a major force in, in Newman, it used to be uh, Newman Iron, uh, sorry Hammersley Iron used to be the company that ran the town and it was only opened up in the 80s um, to be a public town and of course then government took over but one of the critical things is that BHP still managed and supplied power and water to the whole town and surrounding areas. So we made the commitment to the group that look we won't exclude people who need to be involved and as it turned out BHP have been the most amazing colleagues and collaborators on the project. So there's some of the uh, <laughs> activities that we carried out. Um, the cultural learnings in particular going on site with the elders, and in this case BHP were part of that exercise as well. And I mentioned earlier about um, a sacred site that wasn't actually registered. By the time we started doing these uh, site visits and doing our cultural learnings, uh, the people there decided that we were trustful enough so that they identified a site um, that actually hadn't been registered but needed to be protected. Um, site exploration, we did a lot of investigations, uh, board drilling has not happened yet but is uh, planned to be done. We've had a flora 
survey done, we've got a fauna survey about to happen, the place has been surveyed uh, at our cost, although the cost has been borne pro bono by a surveyor, which is fantastic. Interviews, again, not having just meetings, actually going to places where people congregate and in their comf comfortable space and actually just having a yarn. Um, and it's amazing what comes out of just informal conversations. Some of them were more formal than others, as you can see, documents here. Um, and we'll now, with your uh, help, go through two of them, uh, some creative visualisation and the visual prompts, responses, exercises. If you're not up to that, feel free to leave. <laughs> um, but first, ideas mapping. Very much a free form, engage, form of engagement. At the interview, people were so excited about, look, let's start. You know, you're right, we, we hear what you, who you are and what you've done and where you come from and what your ideas are. We want to get started now. So this free form engagement can take all sorts of different formats. And we, at this session we had uh, shy people, health department people, Mission Australia, uh, the Ranger program, we had the traditional owner group there, plus the elders, male and female from the community, and others. Um, and it was really exciting to be part where people started just throwing ideas around about, no, well, yeah, okay, yeah, we need, we need a car park, don't we? Yes, I think we do need a car park. Um, but all those general things, and then people started talking about, well, who's going to manage it? Who's going to be the staff? Uh, we'd like people to be involved in the building of this place, you know, so that they can then take on the management and maintenance of the place. Yes, all good stuff. Okay, creative visualisation. Who's done creative visualisation before, or visualisation before? Anybody? Oh, good. Any, any other? Oh, that's good. Excellent, excellent. I might need to go. <laughs> um, visualisation has traditionally been uh, linked to sports uh, activities. And I being an ex-football, Australian rules football, um, I was never very good at kicking goals, especially in front of goal. Um, and somebody said to me, and I was in my early 20s at the time, I said, have you ever done this visualisation shit? I said, I think about it. There's a visualisation, we were in the pub. <laughs> After a game where I'd kicked three points. Um, he said, you should do this visualisation. I said, oh, okay. So I, anyway, I looked it up and sure enough, next week, I scored a goal. <laughs> it happened to be sort of this part from the goal line, but, <laughs> but it still counts, yes. Um, and in basketball, there's been so many uh, studies done where uh, it's improved throwing from the three, free throw line. Um, so creative visualisation is sort of an extension of that um, and I like, whoops, and I like to take it a bit further. So what we need to do, and with your help, we will break into pairs and be good if you just pull your chairs back and create a place where you're not going to be shouting. So please distribute yourself around the room, but break into pairs. No, you're doing really well. Keep okay. no. no, really okay, so we need one person to volunteer as a commentator and one person as a reporter. So one person is going to be describing what they're experiencing and the other one's going to be writing. <coughs> there are post-it notes on the table. It'll be good. Usually we try and get four or five uh, responses to each question, but I'm going to ask you just to nominate one really critical one that you, you think is the most important. You might talk about three or four, but only put one on the paper and at the end of the exercise we'll put them together. 
Okay, so who's, we got commentators? Is anybody not got a partner? No? Good, next. Okay, so the, the commentator, the person who's going to listen very carefully, please close your eyes and take five deep breaths. Relax. No laughing. There'll be about 20 seconds in between each step, so... Okay, this is about a playground, and we're going to visit a playground. Commentators, you're a bit of a distance away from the playground, but you hear noise, children laughing, shouting. They're having, obviously having fun, there's no arguments. You're walking along a brown path of bricks with grass. Have a look down. Can you see the bricks and the grass growing through the cracks between the bricks? Now look back up towards the playground. Before you go into the playground, what are the first sightings you noticed from a distance? So reporters, listen to what the commentator says and pick one, there might be three or four, but maybe a commentator is there's one thing that is of significance to you that you'll get the, the reporter to write down. Now this might be landscape, equipment, might be what the children are wearing, what some of the conversations are, could be anything. Five seconds. Keep your eyes closed, commentators. The next, the next exercise. Now you're approaching the playground and there is a fence there. You may not have seen it before in the previous exercise, but there is a fence and a gate. Reach out and touch it. Actually reach out and touch it. What's it made of? What's it look like? What is, what is one key feature about the gate that you notice? gate, pass through, yes. and you're inside the playground. What's the first piece of equipment you see? Facilities inside the playground. Providing a service. Boy, it's a sunny day, it's starting to get a bit hot. Look up into the sky, actually look up. It's blue, not a cloud to be seen anywhere. Ah, but you notice some shade. 
you walk over to that shade. What's providing that shade? Okay, you've been in there quite a while now, it's probably time to sit down. Oh, there's a seat over there. Look towards the seat. <coughs> Go and sit down. What does the seat look like and what does it feel like? What does it feel like? It could be materials, shape, texture, colour. Time to leave the playground. Now, there may be an alternative way out. If there is, keep your eyes closed and make your way through that. But if there isn't, just go back through the one that you came through. You're taking ten steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Open the gates. Three you go. Four steps, one, two, three, four, turn around, look back at the playground. Five deep breaths before you open your eyes. And commentators can now open their eyes. Okay, first of all, <laughs> Obviously, the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre, it will have a plate. <laughs> but just to use a simple exercise to demonstrate some of the techniques we use. Um, so, is there any feedback from that exercise? Just one question. When yep. you do that, do you ever consciously think about a trauma informed approach to what you're doing? So, when you're creating visualisations, um, is there any concern that you might have about what people are taking to? That has been an issue. Uh, one of the <laughs> jumping ahead of one. <laughs> but no, one of one of the pitfalls is that we worked with a childcare centre, yeah. and there was a family that had just recently split up, and the um, the mother was quite affected, yeah. and she walked up it. At, uh, in the middle of, of the, uh, the session, she found going to the playground or coming to the centre was a real uh, issue. Um, understanding your client base or who you're working with is important, I think. So it's a very good point, I guess. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so let's just group some of the findings. So we won't go through them all, but when you were looking from a distance, commentators, what was the one thing that you noticed? Just shout it out, just quickly. Commentators. commentators. Oh, sorry, reporters. Sorry. sorry. Colors. Colors of equipment. Yep. Kids laughing. Kids laughing. Not yet. Right. Yeah. Good. Shapes. Easily move around. Oh, okay. Uncared for. Uncared for. Oh, right. Tree, trees and nature. Yep. <laughs> okay. Sorry? Some smart children with that. Oh, very good. <laughs> so, we can, and we, this is what we did on site. So, you can actually draw up. Oops. A matrix board. Whoops. Sometimes it works. 
Anyway, so um, people, uh, technical or equipment, or physical, let's call it, uh, finish. Materials, let's just say. Uh, social. Uh, management. And that's just very quickly picking up some of the things that people talked about. And we then get people to put their sticky notes attached to each one. So you're starting to group them. So why don't you do that? And if you want to, you can add another. If you don't see it fits, happy for you to put another. <coughs> so just rush up all the reporters. Just no, just the just the first one. Yeah, if you want to put it between, that's fine. If you think it crosses boundaries. Now I'm mindful that uh, Ellie gave me a time limit on this, so normally we get you to do all of them. Um, and often there are additional columns added because they don't fit, and we talk about that, um, just to make sure they do get a place in the, on the matrix. So by doing that exercise, it starts that ordering of the issues, and it's a very something we did very early in the project to get a much clearer, um, after the ideas mapping, to get a bit more detail about what people have in here, because what we've found on projects in the past, if you don't get preconception, preconceptions out of people's <coughs> mind, that dominates their thinking and responses as you keep going through the project. And the longer you let that happen, the more that influences how the project develops. So it's important to get out as many of these preconceived ideas as possible. We had a, a case where um, I was a, uh, an observer, not formally invited to a meeting, but I was asked by the community to attend it. And the next exercise touches on this a bit, <coughs> where we, um, he showed a whole lot of photographs of houses and floor plans. So it had a floor plan and then an elevation. And people were then asked to pick which house they, they liked. I said, well, what the hell's going on here? And I asked one of the uh, older gentlemen at the back of the room who was sitting, he was invited, but I wasn't. I said, what are you thinking about these? Oh. I said, which one did you pick? He said, oh, that third one. I said, oh, why? Why that third one? He said, well, it's got a red door. I always wanted a red door on my head. <laughs> Nothing to do with the layout or anything else. So getting ideas out early as possible is really important. Um, language is also important. And you, we've had to modify language. Had a, a case where a good friend of mine was at a uh, health uh, workshop in Willingimby, in fact, in Arnold. And they were talking about the health department are going to run a, a pilot program for nurses to start um, taking all the responsibilities in, in health, so become nurse practitioners. It was before nurse practitioners came about. <coughs> I think Jane heard this one, but anyway. Um, and the meeting went on and on and on. These people up the front, these medical people, Department of Health people, talking about this program. And at the end of the, the session, we were all walking out and this guy said to my good friend, well, that was really good, I, I, but it took me a while to work it out. And I said, and he said, oh, why was that? He said, 
Well, I couldn't work out initially why we wanted our nurses to be pilots and fly aeroplanes. And <laughs> he said, no, 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 they're not flying aeroplanes, it's a pilot program because they just want to try it out. Ah, <laughs> you mean I got it wrong? Maybe they could run that session again. He said, no. Anyway. Next. Okay, visual prompts. So like the red door, dare I say, here we go. Um, the red door and plan. The community said to us when we're starting to work out the process, this what we call the project development process, what would be one of the ways that people could respond to um, ideas about how this centre might look like and how it might um, evolve? And so we said, started talking about visual representations. <clears throat> so people at one session brought a whole lot of um, extracts of magazines or photographs they picked up at various communities or whatever. Um, so we thought, oh, well, that, let's, let's try, let's see what, what works in this. So we call it visual prompts and responses. It's very much an interactive thing, but this time the, the commentator will be the reporter and the reporter will be the commentator this time, just so we share it around a bit. You don't need to close your eyes, however, because you're looking at photographs. So. <laughs> So we're using photographs to stimulate responses, ideas, reactions, feelings. Multiple images, not necessarily quickly, um, but sequentially. And we want to record feelings and comments. Don't have to be technical, it's really about feelings. <coughs> so the first one. This is about interior circulation. Now remember this is for, and these are actual photographs we used in the, in the project. So remember, this is a healing centre. Now you will have different interpretations of what that might mean, but just bear with us. So the first question is, what is your first response to this as a circulation space in the healing centre? Is there anything you didn't like, or you don't like? Is there anything you don't like about this? <laughs> so write them down on your ads, on your notepads. Is there anything you would add? to change it, to make it better in your view. Okay, next one. We're going to forget about the colours. <coughs> okay, relationship to outside. Again, what is your first reaction to this? Feelings. <laughs> If this was in your facility, what would you use this space for? change anything. 
We're going to move on, we're running out of time. Okay, bearing in mind this is a, an alternative to incarceration, there are some, still some standards required in terms of security. So a boundary de definition is, is quite important. So one of this, anybody who knows Alice Springs, the uh, fence along the railway line and the Great Northern Highway, uh, sorry, Stuart Highway. So fencing as art installation, do you think that would enhance the environment? Is that something that would be welcomed in a healing environment? We also use the idea of what about using buildings as being part of the de boundary definition? Landscaping. Bearing in mind it's a flood prone area, could landscaping and decks be used, uh, walkways used? Uh, we're running out of time, I've been told I need to. <laughs> uh, using other structures, so using visual uh, glass basically of roads. Okay, so far, so far, we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, so far, we've been working for three years pro bono. Virtually everybody on this project has been working, including all the engineers, surveyors, the actuaries, the accountants, um, myself and my co architect, have all been working pro bono in excess of a million dollars so far invested. The backing for the project is by very high level um, judges. Um, Honourable Wayne Martin, who's a retired Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, has the backing of the, um, the Premier and the Indigenous, uh, or the Treasurer, who happens to be an Indigenous man in WA. And we're now past the ideas map to a very close to putting together a detailed development application to uh, planning department in the Shire. And the stakeholder engagement had that is so, been so supportive of this, but do you think we could get that first million dollars? That's been um, a challenge. So approvals and funding is now the next stage. So where to now? We continue to work. Um, the vision is being delivered. The, this is purely, again, pro bono. This, um, we actually do have a walkthrough. And one of the challenges of this project has been get, trying to get the approval agencies on board. And one of the challenging ones right now is, like we've done this, this is just an extract of the, uh, the walkthrough, the whole facility that you saw in plan form before. And we've said, this is our presentation to the Department of Planning and the Joint uh, Planning Approval Committee that has to approve it. Um, but they traditionally have always said, in fact, the guidelines say you've got to produce elevation sections, material schedules. And this has all been done pro bono, so we're saying to the, the department, surely this, as uh, preliminary as it is, is better than any drawings that you're going to get that people can't even read and understand. This gives you a much clearer understanding of what it's going. Um, the hope is for a start in 2020, um, but um, we shall see. That's you. So we are keen to get feedback if there are any questions. Awesome. So I'm just going to check the app and see if there's any questions. Last time I checked, there wasn't. 
Um, but I might just go to the floor. Is there anyone who would like to ask um, Jeff a question about this project or the process that he went through or the visualization exercise? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was really interesting. I'm wondering whether, like, in terms of, it sounds like there was a lot of support, but can you talk about any of the maybe opposition that you might have had or come against from people in the community? Is there any opposition to the idea? Um, look, everywhere we go, people say, how come government's not funding this? When the actuaries have actually said that there's 20, uh, sorry, the cost of family violence in Australia across the board is $20 billion a year in terms of socio-economic and cultural damage. This is 40 million for one program. I mean, it's only accommodating 28 people uh, and they don't want it any bigger than that. And what we say is the model can be replicated but you don't copy the solution. So the process we've used to get to the point where this is now being visualised, that can be uh, used, replicated, but not you can't just copy this to go to Northern Territory or somewhere else. It needs to be from the people. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, an agency came to us and said, oh, look, can you go and do the same with another group? I said, yeah, of course. I'd be very pleased to do that. And they said, I'll take all your stuff that you've already done. And I said, no, no you've got it wrong. That's not how we work. Um, anyway, uh, yes, we have had some knockers. It's really interesting with local government, every uh, two to four years, depending on which state you're in, uh, you have re councillors re-elected or elected. And we've now got three new councillors and a new CEO and a new infrastructure director. Two of, uh, sorry, one of the councillors and the new CEO are risk averse. And even though we've gone through all the approvals and everything and getting the land actually formally uh, in the process of being transferred, getting them to contribute to the intersection because it not only services the um, Helix Centre, it services their future development, um, but getting them to consider. You know. I guess the second part of that would be like, how, how do you see a role for kind of community activism or sector, kind of activism or advocacy around funding these kinds of approaches? And it's really good you mentioned that, because yeah. what I wanted to say was Devin sends his apologies because he's in Adelaide meeting up with um, Charlie King from the Northern Territory, uh, some people from New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia <coughs> about setting up a national um, umbrella organisation or advocacy organisation to promote yeah. this type of facility, so healing, not incarceration. Yeah. So that's why it's not the end, yes. So yes, it's definitely needed. Um, and the community are asking for it. And it's not how to justice reinvest. And there will be a forum at the end of November uh, that Devon and uh, another organisation have organised where justice reinvestment is, is the key topic. And Devon's got a place on the panel to or to advocate for the next project. I'm just wondering, if, and this may not be something you can answer yet, but in terms of when somebody perpetrates domestic violence, how do you get them from their home to this facility without it being incarceration? Okay, no, that's a very good question. The first um, round of 14, so the uh, site is developed, is uh, designed in two stages six months in a very intensive program of cultural revitalisation and clinical uh, healing. And then six months in a less structured, but where people actually go out to work, do training, or more detailed training, they do training in the first part too, um, but actually go out to, to do work. How they come into the centre is, the first lot will actually come from Roban Prison, and it'll only be Madhu people, so people, men from, that country, they're the only ones who go there. <coughs> so they are coming from the justice system. And the elders have said, we don't want these mob who are really, they, like they kill their wives, you know, we don't want that top end of violence, we want that the lower end of violence to stop escalation of violence. Um, and the other part of that is that in the future, the next round, they're hoping that 
the local magistrate it's, will give the perpetrator a choice. You can either go to jail or you can go to this centre. It's a voluntary thing. So the boundary definition and security in very commas perhaps comes, and this is one of our discussion points, perhaps becomes less structured because if people decide to uh, absent themselves, then the police will come and take them to jail because they've walked out of the centre. They might be given a warning, but anyway, that's still to be sorted out. Um, so, yeah, so the idea is that it's more a voluntary thing than a Forced, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any part of it like to walk into the family? So I just know like, I managed to have a talk with God for four and a half years. And the challenging thing is when you know, the bloke is getting castrated or going through that, the third of the woman is still staying with them. Yeah. So, and, and Very I think good that's a massive, <laughs> massive big gap is yes. that we need to find some way of working. So in the centre, there's the the male uh, healing part, and then it's been very, made very clear there's no women allowed inside that healing centre. However, it was recognised very early on that the families need to go through a healing process too, so that they are changing and becoming more aware of what's going on with the man. So we now have a, a halfway meeting place, a family centre that bridges both the outside and the inside. So and symbolically it's uh, in both parts. And every month there'll be a, a coming together uh, of the family and the man, still by choice, it's not compulsory. But at the same time, the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre are running a program in Newman for women and children and men who are perhaps right at the bottom end but before they start um, actually causing major uh, family violence. So yes, very good point. So they need to be, it needs to be a, a parallel process. Also, yeah. And that's really good to hear because like I said, I, I worked in that field for a long time and and the struggle was that you need a woman to walk out the door and yeah. back to him. But the children get missed. Yeah. And if we talk about trauma, yes. you know, we really need to look at there needs to be a policy approach. It's very much that way. To move forward because you can maybe take men away for a little while, but guarantee you've got no success. Yeah. No. And, and exactly why having a policy family approach you're then um, building capacity of the young children to learn yep. and see the right behaviours so that um, they don't then become a perpetrator um, as they grow older. Devon talks about intergenerational trauma yeah. and violence, yeah. and it's such a strong part of his personal story. Yeah. Um, and yeah, true. Our watch is just a section in our watch is It has a kind of section on intersectionality and colonisation and violence, which is actually a really interesting yeah. reading. Awesome. All right, thanks everybody for being here. I'm on the timekeeping role. And um, would you please join me in um, thanking Jeff?